appropriate thing to do. Oh, is it because we saw to put the wires in? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, man. Rolling was already hard enough. I was not doing 25 extra. Yeah, it is tedious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so. um. Regardless of how slow I it is. Yeah, it's it's hard. And they don't look bad. So. um. They'll be fine. We'll we'll look at them in more detail in lab this coming week. I had like one. Um, I was really proud of them, and all the others. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, those aren't like, caterpillars. I'm like, oh yeah, and then all the other ones. I was like, hmm. yeah. Exactly. All that has to so be is good enough to fool a bird. All right. So yeah, that's what we'll do on Thursday. We'll put wires in. Mason will. Mason, are you listening? Mason will get to roll out his caterpillars, and then. Um, we'll be ready for after spring break to just deploy them as soon as as soon as weather and bird activity is is improved enough that it makes it worth putting them out. <clears throat> are we putting all like a hundred of each out at the same time, mm -hmm. and then are we going to do like three in each pile? Like, no, them? probably just do the one because ha we have enough there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the college has a golf course that I think it is trying to sell. And so yeah, it's right on right off the edge of campus, north of the north of the fraternity houses. There's a creek, and then there's an old golf course. It's been abandoned for a number of years now, and uh, used to be run by the college, and they stopped running it a number of years ago. And now it's just uh, fallen into uh, disarray. It's going through the process of secondary succession, and there are actually a lot of milkweed plants on the golf course now uh, that have cropped up since they've stopped mowing it. And so it makes a pretty good place to deploy them because they're paved trails. They're the old golf cart trails that are still there. And so you can just walk along the golf cart trails and set out your models. And uh, I don't think they've <coughs> sold it yet. One of the things I have on my list of things to do is talk to facilities and make sure that we still own it. I know. It, well, and I would have to find another place to deploy them, and that's really the easiest place to deploy them because if you put one caterpillar out every five meters mm -hmm. and we have 200 caterpillars. Wait, why did I say we needed? Oh, no, we don't have 50 and 50. We have 100 caterpillars, yeah. So that's 500 meters of linear linear trail that we need to put them along. So why do we have 75? We have 100 of each. Yeah. We have 100 of each. Oh, yeah, I did. I did plan for 100. Yeah, that's why it's 500 grams. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things that we found when we did this with Rose and Kiara is we put them out multiple days in a row. Like, we did it once, and then we collected them, and, and then... Uh, took the data off of it and then put it out again. And each day there were, overall there were fewer attacks over time. And so I think the birds do learn, like, oh, that's just another mouthful of clay. I'm not doing that again. So I think the thing is to put out a good number of them once and get, get fresh, naive birds. And then just a couple of days is all we need. Yep. So, all right. In the interim, what we have to do is we have to get through competition. So hopefully you read the chapter on competition. Uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to tell me what competition is. Um, you'll be able to tell me some things about the types of competition in terms of who it is that's competing. Um, what are the types of competition in terms of how the competitive contest is fought? And so... Um, Different organisms take different approaches to how they kind of resolve competitive interactions or, or how they go about competing. Um, what types of resources can be competed for? And there's a wide variety of resources. Some of them are resources that you would probably think of pretty easily. Some of them are resources that you might not think about as much. Um, and then how do these differences in competitors and differences in the characteristics of the things being competed over affect uh, how competition sort of plays out? Another thing that is on this list of, of things is um, there are different ways of approaching the study of competition as well in terms of the kind of uh, theoretical lens that you view competition through. Uh, so first off, um, 
how would you define what competition is if you had to answer a question on the test? Competition is blah, blah, blah. Oh, that is a dead marker. Hmm? No, I've got, got my bag full of tricks here. What is competition? I did say to read this chapter last time we met, didn't I? Okay, just checking. <laughs> yes. Okay, so it's an interaction. What are they doing again? What is a characteristic of the resource that they are vying for? I realize you've just put vying in place of competing. Yeah. So it would be something that they both need, but what's another characteristic of it? It has to be limited. If the resource isn't limited, do you have to compete? No, okay. So one of this is that the resource is limited. If there's a superabundance of the resource, then both individuals or both species competing for the resource uh, can have it. Um, what is the difference between thinking about competition at an individual level versus thinking about it at a species level? Sure, that would be one place to start. Okay, so we can have interspecific competition where we have uh, individuals from two different species, two or more different species, competing for a limited resource. But then we can also have intraspecific competition. And this means exactly what the, the name means if you interpret it. Um, this is competition among individuals within species. Which of these two things, which of these two types of competition is generally going to be stronger or competitive? Two species competing for resources or two individuals in the same species competing for resources? And why? Think about yourself and a squirrel here on campus. Do you compete much with the squirrel? No. Do squirrels compete with one another, probably? Why? They're competing with the same resources because they are all, they're all squirrels. So two squirrels have the same resource needs. A squirrel doesn't need the stuff that you need, and you don't need the stuff that a squirrel needs, although that would be kind of entertaining to watch. Um, but probably not competitively. Yeah, um, a faculty member at the school where I was an undergraduate had trained the squirrels to come to the jingle of his, his keys. He would jingle his keys and all these squirrels would just come running towards the porch at, at the science building, Miller Science Building at, at SFA. Because over the years he had fed them nuts and stuff and he just used operant conditioning and so when he fed them nuts and they came to the nuts, he would jingle the keys. And he did that often enough that over the years, they just came to associate the jingling of keys with a food reward. So members of the same species have really similar resource needs. As a result, the resources that they're competing for, because both 
individuals of that species need them, then you could expect that competition to be fierce. Interspecific competition, chances are uh, a squirrel and a groundhog don't have very similar resource needs, so you wouldn't expect to see them competing as, as tightly for resources, simply because their resource needs are less similar. And not surprisingly, a bunch of the examples in your textbook are actually about competition among individuals of the same species. And the reason for that is that it's just so much easier to observe that simply because um, the, the strength of competition is going to be stronger that way. In evolution and ecology and ecology, we gave you interspecific competition models and in those models, carrying capacity is basically the measure of intraspecific competition. Um, the more individuals compete for limiting resources, uh, the lower the carrying capacity of the environment is. If resources are not very limiting on individuals, carrying capacity is high. That would represent low levels of intraspecific competition. If resources are limiting, then individuals are going to be competing with one another for those resources more, which means that your carrying capacity of the environment is lower. And so carrying capacity can be thought of in population dynamics models um, as an as indirect or even a direct measure of the strength of intraspecific competition. So um, <clears throat> now that we have an idea of what competition is, we can think about a couple of different ways of thinking about competition conceptually. Uh, one of these I've already introduced to, to you, but we were really cursory when we went through it. We're going to go through it in a great deal more detail now, which is game theory. And the other one is optimality theory. And we've already talked about some optimality models. We've actually already talked about a competition model when we talked about the dung flies at, at cow pats competing for access to females and access to uh, fertilization opportunities. So we've already talked to some degree about ideal free distribution. We're going to talk about it in more detail again. And then there are other, other optimality models that, that can be applied to competition. <coughs> so game theory has been around for a really long time. And game theory is kind of interesting because it was one of these things that um, behaviorists borrowed from the field of economics. Uh, economics was the field that first developed game theory, and then behaviorists figured out that they could adapt the methods of game theory to look at behavior. Um, back during the Cold War, game theorists were hired by the federal government in the Defense Department and the State Department to basically uh, engage in building game theoretical models for how we interact with Russia. And so they would kind of set up the rules of the game, and then they would decide what were the options that the US had, what were the options that Russia had, and then they would look at what the potential payoffs, what the potential benefits and costs were <coughs> of Russia adopting one strategy versus another strategy, the US adopting one strategy versus another strategy. And for many years, um, game theoretical ways of thinking about um, geopolitics was, was a fairly standard thing. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much game theory is used nowadays, but certainly um, given what's happening with Russia over the last week and a half, uh, we might want to start employing more game theoreticians. One of the things that game theory assumes is that both players know what the rules of the game are, they know what the options are. <coughs> Another assumption is that um, the game doesn't extend beyond the game. Um, the game is the full universe of, of options. Nothing happens outside the game. So there's no possibility for retribution or reward outside the game. And then the last kind of assumption is that the players in the game are going to be making decisions rationally. Now, unfortunately, with geopolitics, um, leaders of countries aren't always rational. And so this is one of the places where at least applying game theory to geopolitics can, can break down. 
But one of the one of the classic examples of game theory is the prisoner's dilemma. And so <coughs> this is an example of the prisoner's dilemma uh, that basically lays out the behavioral options for prisoner A and the behavioral options for prisoner B. Under this scenario, um, each individual could cooperate or each individual could defect and rat the other one out. And this is the example that I gave you, I think it was last week when we kind of mentioned this. And so the outcome is dependent not only on the behavior of one individual, but also the behavior of the other individual. So it's where these two behaviors intersect, which results in different results. So if prisoner A stays silent and prisoner B stays silent, they both get a reduced sentence because the, the prosecution can't make a very good case. However, if both of them defect, they each get two years sentence because they both ratted out the other, and so they both turned evidence over to the prosecutor. They get more of a sentence than they would when there was less evidence, but they get less than what they would do if um, they hadn't, because both of them get some benefit for ratting the other person out. If prisoner A stays silent and prisoner B rats prisoner A out, prisoner A gets three years and prisoner B goes free. Cut a deal with the prosecution, get out of jail free card, becomes a state witness. If prisoner A betrays prisoner B, prisoner B gets three years and prisoner A goes free. Under this scenario, what is going to probably happen? What's that? Somebody's going to snitch because there's a big advantage to being the first person to rat the other one out, right? So prosecutors and police do this. They, they use this game theoretical construct in terms of when they interrogate people that they think are colluding in a crime. Uh, did you guys ever watch uh, the movie Capote? Starring the great Philip Seymour Hoffman playing Truman Capote. You guys know who Truman Capote is? No, Truman Capote. Are you guys from the Midwest? <clears throat> Back in the 1950s, late 19, 1950s, 1959, I believe it was, uh, there was a murder out in um, Holcomb, Kansas, which is near Garden City, Kansas, way out in southwestern Kansas. What's that? Yeah, but my grandmother remembers this. My family didn't like Oh, okay. Well, my grandmother was, my grandmother is from Texas, and this made such national news back in the day, because uh, a multiple murder of an entire family in a small town in Kansas, that was very unusual. And so um, this, this family, the Clutters, Herb Clutter, his wife, and his two kids were murdered on their farm in southwestern Kansas. Um, it made the newspapers all the way to New York because um, it was just so unusual. There was no, no apparent motive, no anything. And... Um, Truman Capote, who was a writer, he's the writer who wrote uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Well, he also wrote a book called In Cold Blood, which followed the murder and the, the investigation of the murder and what happened to the two guys who committed the murder. Well, what these guys did was um, well, they had both been in prison together. One of them had worked as a farmhand for this, for this farmer and was under the mistaken impression that he had a, a safe with a bunch of money in his farmhouse because he was a prominent farmer but then there were a lot of things that would say that that's not true the guy was notorious for paying for haircuts with a check and things like this he just didn't keep money on the farm so that whole thing was just totally made up in the mind of this one guy who was in prison but he recruited this other guy that he was cellmates with to after they both got out drive out to western kansas and and rob them when they got there there was no money and they got frustrated. One thing led to another. Um, they kind of went berserk and basically gunned down this entire family. They then went on the lam, 
And when they caught them, if I'm recalling the story correctly, they were all the way out in Arizona on their way back from Mexico. They had fled to Mexico and then they ran out of money and then they were coming back to the United States and they got swept up in, in Arizona. And the Kansas Bureau of Investigation guys went to Arizona to get them. And when they went and got them, they had told the Arizona people, the Arizona police, to put them in separate rooms. And when the Kansas, um, the Kansas Bureau of Investigations guys picked them up, they actually put them in separate cars. So the whole drive home, they were in separate cars. And then when they got back to Kansas, they were in separate interrogation rooms. They kept these guys separate because they don't want each of them to know what the other is saying. Because what they're going to do is they're going to dangle a lighter sentence in front of each of them, hoping to get them to turn on the other. And if they can get them to both turn, then both of them go, go to jail for longer than, than if they had both just stayed silent. So this is a common strategy that, that police use because police, even though they may not have ever taken an animal behavior class, they know the fundamentals of how this particular game operates. But you can modif you can you can analyze any kind of interaction using game theory. So, um, what comes out of game theory is a thing called an evolutionarily stable strategy, and this is a strategy that if it's adopted by all members of the population, it can't be invaded by an alternative strategy. And so. Um, Basically, if you play this particular behavior, that behavior is superior to all the other behaviors. Relatively few games turn out this way where there's just one strategy. But even if there are multiple strategies that might be equally well, you can figure out what the proportions of those strategies should be playing in, in any given scenario. Um, so it may be that a game doesn't have a single strategy that is the one that is the go-to strategy. But maybe you know, one strategy and another strategy can coexist in a population, and there's 75% of one strategy and 25% of the other strategy. And when 75% of the population is playing strategy one and 25% of the population is playing strategy two, they're both achieving the same payoff, essentially. And those are referred to as mixed ESSs, mixed evolutionarily stable strategies. So to, to see how this works, let's look at another example. So when you think about game theory, the first thing that you have to do is you have to know what the payoffs are, and then you have to know what all of the assumptions, what all the rules of the game are, essentially. So this is the hawk-dove game, and this is a situation where two individuals meet, and they're competing for a resource, and... One of these individuals kind of goes on the attack, attacks the other, and then the other has to, has to respond. And the response of the other one is dependent partly on how they're being attacked. And so in this particular game, uh, the, when the winner gains, the victor gets um, 50 units of whatever, whatever the resource is. The loser and gets nothing in the interaction. But sometimes because of the interaction, there is an injury cost. And the injury cost is minus 100. So if you are competing um, for um, a resource and that competition becomes violent, it escalates, you could potentially be damaged in the process. So that's a negative hit of, of 100 units of energy or whatever. And so these are the payoffs and costs. But then here are the rules. When a hawk meets a hawk, when a hawk attacks a hawk, basically um, half the time it wins, and so it gets whatever the winner gets. But half the time, it's also injured in the interaction, so it also suffers the cost of injury half the time. Hawk, 
when hawk attacks dove, the hawk always wins. So it gets the plus 50 units of energy. And when a hawk attacks a dove, the dove just runs away. The, the dove doesn't engage in the interaction, so they lose the interaction, and they get, they get nothing out of the deal. In the same way, when a dove attacks a hawk, because you don't necessarily know what strategy an individual is going to play until you get into the interaction with them, once again, the dove, the dove runs away. And, and, and gets nothing for that. But when a dove meets a dove, they, they share. Oh, isn't that sweet? So they get half of whatever the reward is, which is half of 50. So think about this as two members of the same species. Me and Avery, we're competing over, over the supply, the critical, the crucial, the valuable supply of dry erase markers in an environment where every dry erase marker that you find, you know, half of them are dry. When we come into the room and we want the dry erase markers, we're both human beings. There's nothing about Avery that tells me that she's going to adopt the strategy of Hawk. There's nothing about me that says I'm going to adopt the strategy of hawk. There's nothing about Avery that says she might be a dove. There's nothing about me that says that I might be a dove. We come to it. We see the resource. She employs her strategy. I have to respond if she's the attacker. If she comes at me with dove, then I might respond with dove, and we just split up the, the dry erase markers. But if she comes at me with dove and I respond as hawk, I beat you into submission and I take all of the markers myself. If she comes as me as hawk and then I play dove, I run outside and hide somewhere. So oftentimes we think of this as a single individual might have it fixed in their genetics as to what they play. So maybe Avery plays hawk all the time because she's genetically programmed to play hawk all the time. Maybe Elizabeth is genetically programmed to play hawk all the time, and I'm genetically programmed to play dove all the time. So that's one way in which this can work. But this can also work in such a way that we're all flexible, and we can employ hawk and dove as we see fit. And it may be that you know half the time I play hawk, half the time I play dove, because that's the best strategy to get the highest, the highest um, payoff because I don't ever know what the other person is going to be, to be playing. So um, these, are, these are the payoffs. These are kind of the rules of the game. And so we can make what's called a payoff matrix. So we have the attackers, which are the hawk and the dove on the attack, and then we have the opponents, which are the hawk and the dove. So when a hawk comes up against a hawk, its payoff is essentially half the reward of victory plus half the cost of being injured because these things happen half the time. So this would be half of 50 plus half of minus 100. Half of 50 is 25 minus 50. So when Hawk comes up against Hawk, there's a net cost of minus 25. Okay, so coming up against Hawk often doesn't pay in the end. That's a really terrible situation to be in. So one of the things that this should tell you is that a population of Hawks of nothing but Hawks, it's not a good place to be. Once again, if everybody's playing the strategy of Hawk, either because everybody's genetically predisposed to play the strategy of Hawk, or if everybody just chooses to, to play that, 
it's not good because you, you end up with a net, a net loss, essentially. If you are attacked by a hawk, if you're a hawk on the attack and you encounter a dove, then that's great because you then get you get the the reward of the victor. And so being a hawk has advantages if you're up against a dove. Being a hawk has disadvantages if you're up against another hawk. So if, on the other hand, you are a dove and you go on the attack against a hawk, you don't suffer any negative consequence. You just don't get anything in terms of the gain. But if you are a dove, up against a dove, you get half of whatever the gain is. So if you are a dove in a population of doves, that's actually not such a bad thing. If you are a hawk, so, so let's see... Um, how, how do I want to say this? The frequency with which these two things occurs matters. If you are a dove, a single dove, in a population of, of mostly hawks, let's say that there are 900, sorry, 999 hawks and one individual is playing dove. What normally happens to hawks under this situation? Most of them get a minus 25. In this situation, what normally happens to the dove? They get nothing. But getting nothing is better than getting minus 25. So in a population full of hawks, a single dove can invade because a single dove has a better payoff than the hawks do in a population full of hawks. If, on the other hand, you have a population of doves, 999 doves, and you have one hawk, what's happening with the doves normally? They're sharing. They're getting plus 25. That's not so bad. But in this situation, what happens to that single hawk every time he comes up against a dove? He gets a plus 50. In a situation where hawk is rare, it's better to be a hawk. In a situation where dove is rare, it's better to be a dove. So one of these strategies isn't better than the other. What determines which one is better is how many of the other strategy there happens to be hanging around. It would be like energy lost or energy gain, sure. No, it's just that you're even kill. You're staying the same, whatever the same is, whatever that means. So one of these isn't necessarily better than the other. They vary in their value depending upon how frequent the other strategy is being employed. So this becomes what's known in the business as frequency-dependent selection. If you imagine that there is a gene that controls this, one allele makes you a hawk, the other allele makes you a dove, then selection could act on that gene such that there could be selection that favors hawk, in which the, the hawk allele would increase in frequency, or there could be selection that favors dove, but then dove would increase in frequency. But if you start off with a population of mostly hawks, over time, dove will increase in frequency because the gains, the net gains of being a dove in a population of hawks is higher. So the dove allele increases in frequency. Until you get so many doves, that then doves dominate the population, which means that hawks have the advantage. And so you would see selection favoring the allele that made you a hawk rather than the allele that made you a dove. So what matters is the frequency of this. And this will eventually settle out in an equilibrium. Well, how do we go about finding 
what that equilibrium is. Well, we can, we can actually calculate it. In this situation where the strategy is frequency dependent, what you do is you essentially say, well, what do I expect the proportion of hawks and doves to be in a given, in a given environment? So we can calculate the average reward for hawk. In order to do this, let's say that hawk, that, that H rather, is the percentage of the population that is hawk, which means that 1 minus H is the percentage of the population that is playing dove. So to calculate what would happen, what the average value is for hawk, it is essentially the reward for hawk versus hawk times the proportion of hawks. So that would be the reward for hawk playing hawk times the proportion of hawks added to the reward for a hawk attacking dove times the frequency of doves. And the reason that this is the average is in a population full of hawks, this is going to be really high, close to 1. This is going to be really low. Most of the time you're going to be getting the negative 25. You're going to be very seldom getting the 50, so it becomes this kind of weighted average. We can do the same thing for the average of the dove. The average reward for a dove when it comes up against a hawk is just its reward, which is 0, times the proportion of hawks. But then we add to that the reward when dove goes up against another dove, which is 25 times the frequency of doves. Once again, if you're in a population full of hawks, you experience zero a lot because there are very few doves, and this goes down close to zero simply because the population is dominated by hawks. If you're in a population of doves, you experience a plus of 25 a lot because you are in a population dominated by, by doves. Well, equilibrium conditions are essentially when the payoff for being a hawk is the same as the payoff for being a dove. So to try and figure this out, all you have to do is set these two things equal to one another. So this is the hawk reward, minus 25h, plus 50 times 1 plus h. And then the, this side is just 25 times 1 plus h. So this is the hawk reward, hawk average, and the dove average. So let's start working through this. Minus 25h plus 50 plus 50h equals 25 plus 25h. All I'm doing is carrying the 50 across, carrying the 25 across. 50h minus 25h is a positive 25h plus 50. And then we have equals 25 plus 25h. Is that right? I did the math back in my office, and now I'm questioning whether I've done the math correct. Twenty-five plus twenty-five H. This can't be right because I've done something wrong. Because the twenty-five H's are about to cancel out, and oh,
I had the same problem in my office. Give me a sec to think through it. Oh, that's that's my problem. Signs. Not 50, that's not plus 50H, it's minus 50H. So 25 times H, minus 25 times H, plus 50 minus 50H is equal to 25 minus 25H. Signs. Okay, so minus 50H and minus 25H is minus 75H plus 50 versus 25 minus 25H. Add 75H to each side. We have 50 equals 25 plus 50H. Subtract 25 from each side. We have 25 equals 50H. Divide by 50, divide by 50. H is 1 half. So, hawk and dove get equal rewards when half the population is hawk and half the population is dove. So this isn't a pure ESS where one strategy is the superior strategy. This is a mixed ESS where both strategies exist in the population and the frequency is determined by the details of the payoff matrix. And I'm sorry about the confusing math. I can't seem to carry carry values across uh, when I'm multiplying something times uh, something else in parentheses. So in under these conditions, the under the rules of this game, half the population should be playing hawk and half the population should be playing Dove. Now, once again, this might just mean that there's a genetic component to this, and that means that 50% of the individuals in the population would have the genotype that makes them play hawk all the time, and 50% of them would have the genotype that makes them play dove all the time. Or it could just be a situation where the decision anytime you come up against somebody in your population is... Well, last time I played Hawk, this time I'm playing Dove. And then the next time I'll play Hawk again. And then the next time I'll play Dove again. And if everybody's just alternating that way, 50% of the time playing Hawk, 50% of the time playing Dove, that has the same mathematical equivalency of half the population playing Hawk all the time and half of the population playing Dove all the time. This is what a mixed, evolutionarily stable strategy is. We could change the payoffs. We could make the advantage of winning higher. If we make the advantage of winning higher, what is that probably going to do to this equilibrium? Shift it. Shift it in what direction? If we leave everything else the same. It would be probably shifting towards the hog. Well, you could test that out. You just raise the, the, the winner reward to 60 instead of 50 and see what that does to this equilibrium. What happens if the cost of injury goes down? The cost of injury goes down. Cost of injury only affects hawks, but if it goes down. Oh. then there's less of a cost of going hawk against hawk. So what would happen to hawk frequency? It, it would go up, yeah. What if um, the injury cost goes up? Then it would shift towards doves because hawk going against hawk would be more costly. So this allows you, so having a game theoretical construct for understanding this, it allows you to explore what the consequences are, for example, of competing in such a way that it, indu it has a potential to induce injury. Uh, have you guys ever seen elephant seals compete for mates on a beach? There's not really any beaches here. Yeah, well, <laughs> so a homework assignment for over the weekend, go and get 
elephant seal um, males competing against other males for females on a beach. Do not do it now, Elizabeth. Okay, all right. Um, that is an example where I think you will see that in that case, competing for me females is very costly, both in terms of energy output and also in, in terms of injury. And so um, a game theoretical construct helps us think about, like, well, how injured do you get as an elephant seal? Is that a high cost or is that a low cost? What does that then do to whether you just run away? Is there a size dependency to that, such that if you see a gigantic elephant seal on a beach, you're just not going to tangle with that dude. You're going to take the dove approach and say, I'm going to run away. And, and live to fight another day. And maybe that's influenced because the cost of, of injury during an interaction is relatively high. You can also have iterative games. So there's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole body of literature about, about um, um, game theory. One of the situations is... Um, this game here, the hawk dove strategy, and the um, the hawk dove game and the prisoner's dilemma, those are both assuming that you're going to play that game once with any other individual. But there are also games where you meet the same individual over and over again. And what happens in those cases is the the best strategy tends to be to adopt the strategy that the person that the, that the individual that you're interacting with adopted last time you met. So you could have an iterative hawk dove game, and um, let's say Avery and I are competing over over dry race markers. She comes at me with hawk. I might play dove that time and just run away because she's such an amazing hawk. But if I'm going to meet with her over and over again, I should actually adopt the strategy of hawk simply because she adopted the strategy of hawk last last time. If she adopts the strategy of dove and I play dove, then I will adopt the strategy of dove next time. And so you do whatever was done to you last, essentially. And um, this leads to interesting, can at times um, lead to interesting dynamics. Once again, oftentimes these tip for cat strategies have been explored more in terms of, of geopolitical sorts of, of uh, geopolitical sorts of analyses where a country escalates a military threat well, what does the other country do well it escalates the military threat well then what does the first country do well ramps it up even further and then what does the second country do well ramps it up even further and before you know it you're you're on the verge of, of going to war with one another Figuring out how to get out of these tit-for-tat games is, is something that is of interest to game theoreticians as well. But oftentimes what, what comes out of tit-for-tat strategies is you can get cooperative behavior because um, if you are in one of those situations where one individual is escalating things and you opt to, to de-escalate, if you're in a true tit-for-tat strategy, the response of the first individual, the first player, if the first player is aggressive, the second player is more dove-like, the response of this first player the next time you meet is for them to be more dove-like. And so you can have these escalating situations and de-escalating situations if you are all playing a tit-for-tat strategy, doing what was done to you last. So that's, that's game theory. Any questions about that? So two things for homework for Monday. Uh, one, go watch elephant seals competing with one another for mates on beaches. Um, something I've never seen in the wild, which I think would be very cool to, to watch. Um, and the other thing is, take the hawk dove game and play around with it. Change the reward system. Make the reward for winning higher. Make the reward for winning lower. Make the cost of injury higher. Make the cost of injury lower. See what that does to the, um, the equilibrium. So solve for equilibrium conditions and see what that ratio of hawks and doves is and see if it goes in the direction that you expect it to before you make the change. All right. That will help you understand how it, how it all works. 
Um, ideal free distribution. So uh, on Monday, I'll ask you, like, what did you find when you when you played around with with a hot and dev game? So ideal free distribution, we've already talked about. Um, this is a situation in terms of exploitative competition. So we have um, a, a, another form of oh, another way of thinking about competition that I should have gone through earlier and didn't. The hawk dove game is what we refer to as interference competition. Interference competition is basically there is a group of dry erase markers. Avery is going to come into the room. I'm going to come into the room, and she is going to be hawkish. And what she's going to do is she's going to prevent me from getting access to the dry erase markers basically by pummeling me with a chair. So she's controlling access to the dry erase markers. As a result, I can either run away, take the dove approach and run away, then she gets all of the dry erase markers, or I can also play hawk and I can beat her back and then we get injured, then we incur injury costs, etc., etc. So that's interference competition when one player in the game interferes with another's access to the resource. On the other hand, if there are dry erase markers scattered around the room, how easy is it for Avery to interfere with my access to the dry erase markers. It's not as easy, is it? I mean, she can hide just inside the door and cold cock me with a chair and just take me out as soon as I enter the room. But as long as I make it into the room standing, if she tries to interfere with me, she's going to spend all her time doing what? She's going to spend all of her time chasing me around the room because what am I doing? I'm running around the room collecting the markers. They're like, oh, chase me, Avery. Oh, can't catch me. Oh, I got another one. Oh, Avery's still chasing me. I got another one. Whoever is fastest, whoever exploits the resource best is the person who gets the most markers. If you spend all your time trying to hit me with a chair, I'm just running around the room getting the markers laughing at you. This is exploitative competition. And exploitative competition is best analyzed through something like the ideal free distribution. So you have two habitats, a rich habitat and a poor habitat. Actually, Avery's probably in better shape than me, so she might actually kick my ass in the exploitative arena as well. So in this case, it wouldn't behoove you to adopt an interference strategy. If you want to get the most out of the room, your strategy should be to do what I'm doing, which is run around and collect as many dry erase markers as you can in the time that you have. And the reason that you adopt that is because you can't control access. They're spread out too much. So ideal free distribution. Imagine you have two habitats, a rich habitat and a poor habitat, and individuals can choose freely which habitat to exploit. So this is why it's called the ideal free distribution. Individuals are free to choose where they go and, and get resources. And it's an ideal free distribution because in theory, individuals distribute themselves among these two environments in ways that result in everybody getting essentially the same resource gain. It's an idea put forth by Fretwell back in 1972. Once again, this has been thoroughly explored since then. So this is, this is the situation at the supermarket line. Everybody's goal is to get out of the supermarket as quickly as possible. You have a bunch of places that you can choose to go and get checked out. You look at the environment, you assess the environment, 
you choose the lane that you think is going to get you out the fastest. If everybody in the room is having that same goal, then in theory, everybody's going to distribute themselves across those lanes in ways that everybody spends the same amount of time in lane. So imagine that you have a rich environment and a poor environment. This is the rewards per individual. And as you add individuals to the environment, the overall gain of that environment goes down because you're packing more and more individuals onto there. So if you have 10 individuals on the environment, you get this amount of reward. If you have one individual in the environment, you get this amount of reward. And so we can think about these two environments. An individual comes into an area. There's a patch over there that is rich in resources. There's a patch over there that is poor in resources. And individual one says, which am I going to go to? Well, which one are you going to go to? You go to rich because that one, when there's only you, there's nobody else there, it has the highest reward. So individual one goes to the rich environment because the reward is higher than the poor environment. Now, individual two comes along, sees a rich environment over there where there's one individual, sees a poor environment over here where there's nobody. You might think, oh, well, I should go to the environment where there's nobody, but because he has complete knowledge of the environment or she has complete knowledge of the environment, that individual knows that going to the rich environment still gives you more energy, more resource, more reward than going to the unoccupied poor environment because if you're the second person, second individual in the rich environment, you get that much reward and that's still way above the maximum reward of the poor environment. Same thing with individual three. Comes in, sees a patch over there with two individuals, sees a patch over here with no individuals. That's the rich patch. This is the poor patch. But because they have perfect knowledge, you still go to the high environment because the higher environment still has a higher reward than the poor environment. Same thing for individual four, individual five, individual six, individual seven, individual eight, and individual nine. But as you're stacking individuals up in that rich environment, what is happening to the quality of that environment? It is decreasing until you get to the ninth individual. And then the 10th individual comes along and is like, that's a rich environment, but it's got nine individuals in it. That's a poor environment that nobody is using. But once again, because these individuals have perfect knowledge of their environment, individual 10 recognizes that if individual 10 joins the rich environment, he or she is going to achieve less reward than being the first individual in the poor environment. So 10 says, I'm not going to the rich environment. I'm going to be king in the poor environment, and I'm going to get a higher reward. Now, individual 11 comes along. Individual 11 comes along and says, well, I could go to the poor environment with 10, or I could go to the rich environment with the other 9. But when you look at individual 11's payoff, it's very close to 10's payoff. Those two lines are, are just barely apart. When you get to individual 12, individual 12 can either go here or here. 12 still has a higher payoff in the poor environment than being the 10th individual in the rich environment. You get to individual 13, and at this point, individual 13 can either go and be the 4th individual here or the 10th individual here. When you do the math, it's better off to be the 10th individual here than to be the fourth individual here. And so individual 13 goes to the rich environment. But that means that individual 14 can either go to that rich environment or can be the fourth individual in this poor environment. 
That is a way higher reward than that is. So individual 14 should become the fourth individual in the poor environment. At this point, what is the payoff for everybody in these two environments? What's the reward for everybody in these two environments? Yeah, the payoff for the individuals in the rich environment is here, a little above the payoff for all the individuals in the poor environment. And this is what the ideal free distribution says. If individuals are making these decisions in this way, everybody ends up getting the same thing. Now, are these individuals getting as much as if there was only one individual in the environment on the whole? No, but these 14 individuals are dividing up these two resource patches in such a way that everybody's getting as much as they can get given that there are 14 individuals here. And you could continue playing this thing out over the course of, of individual 15, individual 16, individual 17 until you finally get to the point where you've exhausted the resources in both of these, these environments. This is how the ideal free distribution operates. Now hopefully you can never go to the grocery store and think about a trip to the grocery store the same. I mean, I always go to Walmart and I never have the cashier bills anyway, so I was waiting like the hour long line at the store. I was going to go to the grocery store where I live and I was like, I'm going to go to the grocery store. Yeah. There's never cash. Oh. So, so here's what you can think about as you think about that. Are you going to go to Walmart where, in theory, they have more stuff but they have fewer cashiers versus going to Hy-Vee if what you're doing is grocery shopping? A 25 minute drive. Like two. Okay. Well, so, so you're, you're making all of these decisions based on quality of the resource, quality of the patch. You know, Walmart is a crappy patch, but the travel time to get there is really short. hy V better patch potentially because there are more checkers, but you have the added travel time. I do like the hy V is closer here in the primary. It's more expensive. All right. So the assumptions of the ideal free distribution we've already talked about. Individuals are free to move around. There's no interference competition. Um, Avery's not cold cocking you with a chair and uh, individuals possess complete information. As soon as interference enters into the equation, that prohibits people from being free to move around and um, possessing incomplete information. Um, individuals possessing incomplete information makes it harder to make the decision on where to go. So for example, you're in line at the grocery store and you see somebody standing there and they have like one item. And it's a dude, because dudes are lazy. And it's a dude there with his box of Snicker bars. And what he's done is he's gotten in line while he's waiting for his girlfriend or his wife to run around the store and get all the other items. You get in line behind him because you think, oh, he's going to be quick. He's just buying some Snicker bars. And then she shows up five minutes later with a basket full of stuff. Incomplete information. Now you're in line behind this thing that's going to be much longer than you expected. And as a result, your average time goes way up in that line. So what do you do? Well, if you're Avery, you cold cock that guy with a chair and then go get in another line. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll continue discussing uh, ideal free distribution on Monday. We have an exam on Wednesday, yeah. So my goal on Monday is going to be to make it as far through competition as I can without, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put on the afterburners and blaze through material just to finish, but we'll work through it as far as we can. Whatever we get through on competition, that'll be what's on the exam. We're about a day behind because, um, Pair pay interaction took a little longer than, than I was expecting. So it's not catastrophic, but we are a little behind. 
have a good weekend and i'll see you guys on monday